This is the 15th in a series of lectures giving an introduction to exterior differential systems. In the previous lecture, we finished our proof of the cartan kähler theorem, and that's the most difficult part of our lectures in exterior differential systems. Things get a little bit easier, more um, manageable in this, uh, in, in this lecture. We want to think about Cauchy characteristics, which represent, in some sense, unused variables in a system of, of differential equations or an exterior differential system. Let's think about what an unused variable should mean in the case of a PDE system. Here's a simple PDE system, ux x equals 0 for some function u of x and y. What's surprising, though, is that it's for a function of x and y because the differential equation ux x equals 0 doesn't use the y variable at all. There's no y appearing, no y derivative appearing in it. So the solutions are just given by taking a solution to the system uxx equals 0 with no y variable, and then making the initial data simply depend on y. So it's very easy to understand how to generate the solutions uh, with the unused variables in terms of the resulting system with, uh, with, without any unused variables. So this is the phenomenon we want to, uh, to, to generalize for exterior differential systems. It's surprisingly often the case that there are unused variables. When we work with exterior differential systems, it's a phenomenon we encounter very frequently that there are these sort of unused variables appearing. But most often, exterior differential systems appear in a geometric context in which we don't really have variables at all. We work on some manifold with some abstractly given differential forms, and so it's not that obvious immediately how we would recognize that in some system of coordinates there will be some variables not used. We want to see how to recognize that and take advantage of it. Now, an unused variable is a sort of special kind of symmetry in our example, for instance, since there were no y's appearing in our differential equation, translating in the y variable does nothing. So it's clear that this is a special kind of symmetry. It's not an arbitrary symmetry, though. The x variable was used in the differential equation, but it was also translation invariant in x. So unused variables aren't just any old symmetry. They're a special kind of symmetry. Let's consider a general symmetry theory for the moment. Let's try to understand how we can make sense out of, out of symmetries of differential, uh, exterior differential systems. So what should be a symmetry be for an exterior differential system? The first and most obvious definition would be just a diffeomorphism preserving the system. But we'd like to work locally. We'd like to use calculus. So let's try to find some kind of infinitesimal description. So if we wanted to work infinitesimally, we'd look not for a diffeomorphism, but for a vector field whose flow preserves the system. And that should be somehow the notion of symmetry we might want to work with. We'd get some Lie algebra of vector fields whose flows preserve the system. The problem with this definition is that the exterior differential system is a global object. Our definition of an exterior differential system is that it's an ideal of differential forms. Those differential forms then have to be globally defined in the entire manifold. So that means there, there's a problem when we want to work locally. Um, because if we construct a vector field, it might not have a flow, globally speaking. It may only have a local flow. Vector fields only have flows, in general, defined on small open sets. So how do we then uh, make sense out of the idea of preserving an exterior differential system along the flow when the flow isn't globally defined and the exterior differential system is? So we want to say that, that if we worked with global differential forms using the definition we have for exterior differential system, symmetry would become a global notion. And we could only test symmetry for vector fields which are known to be complete, which is a global condition. So finding symmetries would require global computations. It would require global information, which might be difficult to get. So we're better off working with something much more local. But it means that in order to have a local definition for symmetries, as sort of local vector fields that locally preserve the system, we need a local notion of exterior differential system. So it'll be useful for us to throw out the previous definition and adopt a new definition, which is much more localized. And still, all of our theorems will remain true, and we'll be able to use this more local definition to give uh, some, some, uh, uh, some little uh, theorems about symmetries that, that, that are 
uh, more easily stated and, and more simply stated using a local definition of exterior differential system. So it's easier to allow local symmetry vector fields and a local definition of exterior differential system. Local symmetry vector fields don't necessarily have global flows. So what do we mean by global, uh, by, by a local symmetry vector field being a solution of uh, a symmetry of a global system? In order to make sense out of that, we've got to localize the definition. So we localize the definition of exterior differential system. It should be a collection of, vector of differential forms. An exterior differential system is still a collection of differential forms, but they're defined on various open subsets of the manifold, not necessarily on the whole manifold. So we want an exterior differential system to be a collection of declosed differential forms, ex closed or exterior derivative. They should restrict to open subsets. So if a differential form from, from this exterior differential system is defined on some open subset, its restriction to any smaller open subset is also defined and in the exterior differential system. They should glue together. So if you have a collection of open sets, and on each one of them you have some element of the exterior differential system, and if on the overlaps of those open sets, those elements agree as differential forms, then there's a unique differential form which restricts to every one of those open sets to be every one of those elements. And that differential form should also lie in the exterior differential system. So when you have agreement on overlaps, you get to glue together and make a, a more globally defined object. And of course, the exterior differential system should be graded for any open set U we should be able to write all the forms in the exterior differential system on U as direct sums of the forms in the system that are one forms, those that are two forms, and so on. Okay, so this just recovers the, our previous definition, but it allows, it allows restriction to open subsets. It makes these things um, into uh, some sort of locally defined objects, and once you know what they locally are, you can glue them together and get the globally defined object. And the, of course, the one further condition we need is that for each open set U, the differential forms that are defined on U and belong to our system should form an ideal in the differential forms defined on U. So putting those, those together, that's the definition of an exterior differential system. And it's a local definition because we really only know what the, what the local members of this exterior differential system are in small open sets that cover the whole manifold, and then we can glue them together. Uh, well, let's say on a basis of open sets, then we can glue them together. So this local definition enables us to uh, to work with a local notion of vector field, of symmetry vector field. All the theorems we've had so far hold just as well with this new definition as with the old one. So it's it's actually just as convenient, a little bit more technical. And we didn't really need it for any of the theorems we had so far, so we're only introducing it at this point, where it turns out to be convenient for thinking of not only about uh, the theory of symmetry vector fields, but for actually getting a few of the simple theorems about symmetry vector fields. So a symmetry vector field is just a vector field V whose locally defined flow preserves the exterior differential system. Um, and it could be a vector field defined in an open set if we like. Um, it doesn't have to be globally defined. So we now have a notion of symmetry vector field, and the symmetry vector field forms some, some collection of Lie algebras on the open sets of the manifold. Um, a symmetry uh, vector field, uh, a vector field is a symmetry vector field if and only if it satisfies this condition that uh, it's li the lead derivative uh, of the, along the vector field uh, applied to all the forms in the system gives forms from the system. And again, that's proven in the lecture notes in detail. We don't want to spend a lot of time on the proofs of these results about symmetries. They're very straightforward. Um, a, a, an exterior differential system is said to have finite type. If near each point of our manifold, we have some generators which generate all the forms near that point. This is a subtle definition. Finite type is the same definition you find in, in other areas of mathematics where finite type is used. Um, so it's not the same as saying that, uh, uh, that each, um, each, each collection of forms defined at an open set U is finitely generated. What it says is that you can, if you have a point, you can pick an open set U around that point. You can find generators in that open set U that generate all the forms in all the subsets of U, not just in U itself, but in all the subsets of U. 
So it, even in some much, much smaller open set, you're still able to use those same forms to generate. So it's a bit subtle. Okay, so finite type is the condition we're going to need. Again, it says that near each point, there are some generators so that in all the su open subsets near, even smaller open subsets near that point, is those generators still generate all the forms. All right, so we'll need that finite type condition. And then uh, a symmetry will just have the property that it just, will just be a vector field with the property that the lead derivative on the generators gives linear combinations of generators. So that's how we can test for something being a symmetry when we have an exterior differential system of finite type. So for systems of, systems of finite type, you only need to check generators. For other systems, of course, it could be terrible. But for system, systems of finite type, we can check whether or not um, a vector field is a symmetry by asking whether the lead derivative of the vector field applied to generators gives linear combinations of generators. Okay, so that's how we can test if something is a, is a symmetry using a sort of finite local test. Now, how do we decide if we have unused variables? Let's leave uh, the whole notion of symmetry in general and just think very specifically about the unused variables problem. A vector field is said to be a Cauchy characteristic vector field if when you hook it into the exterior differential system, you get vector, you get differential forms from the exterior differential system. What does that hook mean, V hook I? So this hook sign here, that means we plug V in. So if we have a differential form, which is say a three form in our system here, I, we plug that vector field into the first slot in that three form, giving us a two form in I. That's what we're asking for here. We're asking for, uh, for vector fields which have the property that when you plug them in to the first entry in a differential form, leaving the other entries blank, you end up with a differential form which is still in the ideal I, in the system I. Okay, so that's what we'll call a Cauchy characteristic vector field. And I'll leave, leave you to check. Um, again, it's, uh, it's a, an exercise in the notes carried out in the back that, uh, that uh, this corresponds exactly to a symmetry, uh, or sorry, that this is a kind of symmetry, um, that every Cauchy characteristic vector field is, uh, is a symmetry vector field, although the converse isn't true. There are symmetry vector fields that are not Cauchy characteristic, but every Cauchy characteristic vector field is a symmetry. Roughly speaking, these are the unused variables. And again, that will be dealt with in, in the notes in, in a, a complete proof, but here we'll just give some outline of the proof of why uh, we can quotient out by uh, those unused variables. Um, so let's be a little bit more precise. Suppose that the Cauchy characteristic vector fields uh, in, on, on, our exterior, on our manifold of our exterior differential system have constant rank. Um, and that's a technical hypothesis which we'll have to assume to get this to go. Um, so if they have constant rank, you can check that they then satisfy the conditions of the Frobenius theorem. Those Cauchy characteristic vector fields have orbits that are actually leaves of a foliation. The Cauchy characteristic vector fields will exactly be the vector fields which are tangent to the leaves of some foliation. And so every foliation is locally a vibration. Every foliation locally has a quotient space. So after we you know, maybe we pick a point, we look at maybe some open, replace M by some open neighborhood around that point, then we can construct a quotient space so M goes to some M bar quotient space so that the fibers of that map are exactly the leaves of that foliation. In other words, that two points are, are lying the same fiber of pi if and only if you can flow from one to the other by Cauchy characteristic vector fields. Okay, so, uh, so then it turns out the exterior differential system drops. So again, I'm not proving any of this in these lectures. Uh, it's all proven in the lecture notes. But the exterior differential system drops in the sense that there is an exterior differential system I bar on M bar. And so that the original system I on M is just generated by the pullbacks of forms from M bar. In fact, we can actually state what is this I bar? What is this quotient? It's uh, the push forward. So we have both a pullback, just pull back and take what's generated, 
That's so that's here. We take the pullback fo forms and then generate whatever exterior differential system is generated by them. We also have a push forward. The push forward is simply given an exterior differential system, we push for push it forward by taking the push forward system to be the collection of forms in the in the target manifold whose pullback to the source manifold lies in the system. That's easy to check. That's also an exterior differential system. So what we've got uh, here is a claim that uh, if we have uh, constant rank Cauchy characteristics, we can at least locally construct a quotient space, and the exterior differential system drops. That is to say, it's generated by the pullback of the push-forward system. So that means that it's, it's going to be possible to reduce the problem of constructing integral manifolds on M to the problem of constructing integral manifolds on M bar. Okay, so that gives us the theory of Cauchy characteristics um, that the main result that if these Cauchy characteristics have constant rank, then we can, uh, we can at least locally construct some quotient. All right, so usually the quotient space is actually easy to spot in examples, and we'll see how to do that in some examples. Um, so it won't be that hard to figure out geometrically what is this M bar? What, what sort of a space could M bar be, given what M is and given how the Cauchy characteristics show up? So we want to have a theorem about um, being able to, to use these Cauchy characteristics. Suppose that we had a finite type exterior differential system, and suppose that we had a submersion from M to M bar, uh, some uh, submersion of, of manifolds, and suppose that it happened to have the property, so M bar could be any manifold, it pi could be any submersion whatsoever, but it has Cauchy characteristic fibers. What does that mean? That means that the tangent spaces are spanned by Cauchy characteristic vector fields. So then, um, uh, tangent spaces of the fibers are spanned by Cauchy characteristic vector fields. And then suppose we have one more condition. Suppose that for any two components of a fiber, so the fibers of, of pi are not necessarily connected, right? They could have many components. Suppose that for any two components of any fiber of pi, there's some diffeomorphism of M that preserves the exterior differential system I and swaps those two components. So it has to act, in other words, the, the diffeomorphisms preserving I have to act transitively on the components of the fiber. We don't have to understand what they all, all of those diffeomorphisms are. We just have to write down enough of them to get a transitive action on those fibers. Then, uh, on those components of the fibers, then, um, then in fact, the exterior differential system is the pullback of the push forward. So we can uh, essentially use this as, as, as a theorem to, uh, to, to find unused variables. We can say that the, that the map pi is actually somehow uh, squishing the system uh, from M down to a system on M bar in such a way that we can really recover everything about M from understanding this, the quotient system on M bar and vice versa. The two systems are really essentially equivalent, but M bar will in general have fewer variables. Okay, so in order to use this, we'd have to check Cauchy characteristic fibers, which is uh, it's just an infinitesimal condition, a condition on the tangent planes of the of the fibers. We have to check that they're they're spanned by Cauchy characteristic vector fields. But we also have to check the existence of some kind of diffeomorphism to swap the components of the fibers, and that'll usually be something fairly obvious geometrically in our examples. And then we'll be able to say that the system upstairs is really somehow up on M, is actually really coming from a system down on M bar. Okay, so how would we um, use how would we use this in examples? If you actually had a tableau written out, how would you detect the existence of these Cauchy characteristics? So let's see, imagine we have a tableau where we've written and out in a co-framing of thetas, omegas, and pi's as we've written before. How do we find Cauchy characteristic vector fields? Those co-framings are one forms, they're not vector fields. But suppose that we happen to notice that some omega i or some pi alpha doesn't show up in the tableau. We have a co-framing, so thetas, omegas, and pi's, they, they span every cotangent space. But certain of them don't arise in the tableau. We aren't, we aren't needing to write them down. We write out all of our tableau uh, expressions for all of our differential forms. Certain of, them, of those pi's and omegas just don't appear anywhere. We'll look at examples. Then, in fact, the dual vector field 
of that omega i or pi alpha uh, that in the dual basis, the basis of vector fields, is a Cauchy characteristic vector field. And that'll make it easy to spot because if we have some omegas and pi's missing, um, then they're all they're all linear dependent. You just count how many of them are missing, and that'll give us the rank of Cauchy characters of those Cauchy characteristic vector fields, and that'll make sure that they're constant rank. So we'll be able to use our theorem. Okay, let's look at an example. See if we can actually see a case where there are missing uh, omegas and pi's in the tableau. Consider just a surface in R three in, well, three-dimensional Euclidean space. We know that it has some sort of structure equations, which we've written out. They look like this. The vanishing of omega-3 and the vanishing of the gamma-3 i's minus a i j omega j's. Now that's not really defined in R3. Those are up on the frame bundle, those omegas and gammas. And we have to add coordinates for those a i j's to the frame bundle in order to be able to write that as an exterior differential system. Note, though, that this system doesn't have gamma 1, 2 anywhere in it. It has omega 3, you can see right there, and among those a, i, j, omega j's, it has omega 1 and omega 2. It has gamma 3, 1 and gamma 3, 2, but it doesn't have any gamma 1, 2's in it. So, in fact, if you look at it as thetas, omegas, and pi's, those are just the thetas. We also have the omegas and the pi's. And if you write it all out, you'll see, of course, the DAs appear in, in the pi's. We also have omega 1 and omega 2 appear as the omegas. And uh, what we're missing, though, is gamma 1, 2. It doesn't appear anywhere in the system. When you expand out the tableau for the system, you'll see there's absolutely no, there's no gamma 1, 2's. Uh, so that must be uh, telling us that there's a Cauchy characteristic vector field. The dual vector field of gamma 1, 2 in the appropriate co-framing is a Cauchy characteristic vector field. And what does it mean when you flow in the dual to gamma 1, 2? What does gamma 1, 2 measure? It measures the tendency of E1 to, to move toward E2. So that dual vector field on the frame bundle just turns the E1, E2 plane with E1 moving toward E2. It turns that plane, but it leaves E3 sitting where it is, and it doesn't move the point X where we're sitting. So it fixes the point. So at each point of the frame bundle, you fix the point where you're sitting, and you turn E1 in the direction of E2, E2 in the direction of minus E1, all around. You rotate that around, and you leave E3 fixed. That's a Cauchy characteristic vector field. So we should be able to quotient by it. But it's not the only thing we can find here. There's another symmetry of the system. Remember the M, our manifold, on which our exterior differential system lives, is not just the frame bundle V3, it's actually the frame bundle V3 crossed with a choice of AIJ quadratic forms. And those quadratic forms are written out as actual AIJ as uh, real numbers. So it's, uh, so it's a manifold with, uh, with a six dimensions of the frame bundle of three-dimensional Euclidean space. There's six dimensions there, but there's three additional dimensions for the quadratic form AIJ. So it has this uh, this nine dimensions. Okay, so it's a nine-dimensional manifold. And we're trying to construct an eight-dimensional quotient by quotienting out this gamma 1, 2, uh, the dual vector field of gamma 1, 2, this Cauchy characteristic. What is the quotient? But before we consider the quotient, we can remember, the, okay, that gamma 1, 2 represents rotation around the tangent plane, so we can see that the quotient should involve allowing us to rotate but um, we can also reflect. We have a one diffeomorphism, which is the reflection that reflects E3 to minus E3. So if we're on the frame bundle M uh, with its quadratic form, the so space of, of frames and quadratic forms, we can reflect E3 to minus E3. And if you then go back and look up here, if you reflect E3 to minus E3, you're going to change the sign here, because that's a gamma 3 one. You're going to change the sign here, which is fine. It'll still be 0. But if you change a sign here in gamma 3 1, you're going to change, have to change a sign somewhere in here to make up for it. The omegas aren't going to change, so we'll change the a's. So that means we should reflect E3 to minus E3 and Aij to minus Aij, and then we'll preserve that exterior differential system. So that's a symmetry also of the exterior differential system. So we're going to quotient not just by rotations around the tangent plane, rotations, in other words, in the, in the E1, E2 plane. We're also going to 
quotient by this one reflection operation, this one diffeomorphism, simultaneously quotienting out ref rotations of E1 toward E2, E2 toward minus E1, and at the same time quotienting out by this reflection. We'll take our nine-dimensional manifold M and produce an eight-dimensional quotient, which will quotient out by this circle action of rotating E1 in, in, in the E1, E2 plane, but also, at the same time, this um, this uh, Z mod 2Z action of reflecting E3 and, ref and, and changing the signs of all of the shape operator entries. Okay, so that's going to be how we'll, we'll act on this manifold and to produce a, produce a quotient manifold. So what is that quotient then? It's pretty clear geometrically what it consists of. It's the collection of all pointed planes with a quadratic form valued in the normal line. Let's, let's think about how that works. Well, at each point of the frame bundle, we have a, a point x of the underlying Euclidean space. That doesn't move under this group action. And so there's still a point, and that's why I've got a pointed plane. The E1 and E2 rotate, the ro E1 and E2 plane rotates around, but the plane itself still exists. It's still invariantly defined as a plane, and so that plane is part of the information in the quotient. When we look at that quadratic form Aij, we changed its sign when we changed the sign of E3. That means that if we multiply E3 by Aij, we don't change that. And so that's actually going to be, uh, be why we have a quadratic form valued not in numbers, but in the normal line. E3 uh, spans the normal line. And if we change E3 to minus E3, we're changing bases of the normal line. But we're also changing the sign of the quadratic form. And so we get a well-defined object value in the normal line. And as we rotate E1, E2, we also ro change the values of the Aij coefficients so that the exterior differential system is invariant. And, and therefore, consequently, we obtain a quotient system which consists of the choice of a pointed plane, so a plane with a marked point on it in Euclidean space, with, uh, which has a quadratic form valued on that plane, valued in the normal line to that plane. So that's how we can see what the quotient space is. And we might hope maybe to just write down the exterior differential system on the quotient space. Maybe we should work directly on M bar rather than on M, because this M bar is, some, is lower dimensional, and we have a system we know defined on it. We know that the system we wrote down actually quotients to this system. So we had a system that we wrote down on M, which whose integral manifolds just consist of surfaces in, in, in Euclidean three-dimensional space. But we now have this quotient system. Maybe that's even better. Maybe we should work there. But it turns out there's no invariant forms on M bar because the forms we wrote down, the soldering forms, the connection forms, and so on, all those forms don't make sense anymore on M bar. They don't survive the quotienting process. The exterior differential system survives, but nothing in it survives. That is to say, it doesn't have invariantly defined generators anymore because the generators themselves don't have to survive the quotienting process. They may be transformed among one another in some non-trivial way by the, by the group action. So when you quotient, there's not necessarily an actually well-defined invariant set of forms to write down. So that's why we like to work on M rather than M bar. We work on M where we have invariantly defined forms and we can calculate the, um, the results of our cartan kähler computation. We can calculate out integral elements and, and characters and so on using explicit invariantly defined forms, the soldering forms, the connection forms, and so on. We can't necessarily do that on the quotient space M bar. So that's why we don't like to work on M bar directly. We don't like it because it doesn't necessarily have a nice uh, choice of differential forms to work on. So when we were faced with Cauchy characteristics, we usually actually work on M, but we come up with information, with results about M bar because the quotient system is essentially the same system. It's almost the same. It, uh, you know, has, has all the same uh, features arising. So these integral manifolds correspond, and so we can easily calculate results about M bar by working on M. That's the idea. So it's often easier to work on M, where we have invariantly defined forms, but we can often conclude facts about some M bar, which may be more abstract and more, more geometric. M is somehow the world of algebra, and M bar the world of geometry. We always find there's some some tension between trying to uh, make the, the algebra nice and trying to make the geometry nice. And the algebra is nicer upstairs on this M, 
but downstairs on m bar is where, th where the meaningful geometry lives. So next time we'll apply all of this uh, theory of the Co Cauchy characteristics to, uh, to a more sophisticated example. We've already talked about surface invariance, but we could really look at the specific case of isometric immersion. We can see how to carry out the construction of the M bar, and then we can also try and understand the geometric interpretation of non-characteristic initial data.